Welcome to the Anime Research Group, a show about the weird and wonderful mistake that is anime. I'm Ian. I'm Denny. I'm Fran. And this week, in our quest to watch all the shows we never had time for, we look at Gunbuster. Gunbuster! <laughs> and try to avoid comparing it to Evangelion. But before we do that, we should talk about what we've been doing. It's been it's been a while since we've like sat and actually recorded a podcast. I mean, over the last few weeks, I've watched a bunch of anime. I we watched all of Gurren Lagann, which was a lot of fun, and I hadn't seen in years. Man, that show holds up so much better than I remembered. I also finally watched Nausicaa, which I don't think I'd ever seen up to this point. Um, that was a good movie. And then I rewatched Porco Rosso, which, when we rated the, the Ghibli movies on our own time. I feel now that we really underrated because, man, is Porco Rosso good. Most importantly, it has a pig who fights fascists. Yes. yes. It's better to be a pig than a fascist. Um, unless by pig you mean Bolivian police officers. Yes. In which case, I, I guess it's still better than being a fascist, but not by as much as you'd hope. That'd be a giraffe than a fascist? Don't know anything about giraffes. <laughs> uh, how about you, Freya? How have you spent your uh, your break from the I podcast? I watched Gunbuster. Well, how convenient! I mean, we've all watched Gunbuster, I hope. But other than that... Denny and I finished Hypnosis Mike. Maybe at some point we'll do an episode with somebody who knows something about hip-hop. Yeah, if this happens, I won't be around for this. Not because I'm not pro-rap battles or hip-hop in general. It's just that I didn't like Hypnosis Mike. <laughs> Yeah, then we'd also have to subject our guests to all of this. Like, or I guess we could just show him the rap battle, them the rap battles. Yes, the worst bit of the show. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very entertaining show to watch, even though it wasn't very good. How about you, Ian? Well, I didn't watch anime because I spent that time reading about anime. So at some point, I'm probably going to avoid talking about Beautiful Fighting Girl today as much as I can, but it's almost certainly going to come up when we talk about Die Buster. And I've been watching Captain Scarlet, which is great. <laughs> Look for a special episode on Jerry Anderson sometime. Actually, yeah, there is a good chance of that happening. So, Jenny, please tell us about Gunbuster. Gunbuster! The anime was released from October 1988 until July 1989 for a total of six OVAs. It was made by Studio Gainax, which I don't think really needs an introduction, but I'll give you a little primer on it. The studio was the first studio to be founded by anime fans rather than professional animators. And that's why it sucks. What? <laughs> As they debuted their, uh, their well-known short Daikon 3 at the Japan National Sci-Fi Convention in 1989. Its founders were Hideaki Anu, Yoshiyuki Sadamoto, Hiroyuki Yamaga, Tamaki Akai, Toshio Okada, and... Yasushiro uh, Takeda and Shinji Higuchi. Two years later, they returned to the same convention with their much more well-known work, Daikon 4, whose big, whose rousing success allowed them to get their start as a studio. Their first work was The Royal Wings of Honomizer, which was a critical but not commercial success. We'll be doing an episode on it soon. <laughs> After that, they made Gumbuster in 1988, which did serve as a critical success, allowing them to continue as a studio. Next, they made Nadja of the Blue Water as their first TV show. And though that was a hit, they, uh, their contract really prevented them from profiting off it. They also made Otaku no Video, which is something I'm sure we'll talk about at some point in our quest to become Otakings. It's, no. it's, it's amazing. Everyone should watch Otaku no Video. It really took the studio until 1995 with, of course, the release of Neon Genesis Evangelion to become a major staple in the industry. The studio continues to release a bunch of classics over the next decade, such as Fully Cooley, Gurren Lagann, or uh, Panty and Stocking. But since then, it's really become a shell of its former self. Their last actual anime was released five years ago, and their last big success with Gurren Lagann, it's been 14 years since then. Most of the talent has left the studio uh, to form their own such as Imaishi, who went, to form, who went on to form Trigger, or Anno, who went on to form Kara. And Gainax is mostly just a name at this point, though they're still talking about releasing some stuff based on Neiji Matsumoto in the next few years, but whether that actually happens is a different question. We'll talk about the reasons for the decline at some other point, uh, I think probably in the next, uh, in the next episode. All right, when you're talking about Gainax now, are you referring to Gaina, or is there actually still a Gainax that's not Gaina? There is still an actual Gynax. 
Yeah, but I, I, well, I mean, is are they releasing stuff or? I mean, they haven't released anything since. But when you look on Wikipedia on their upcoming page, it does say. Because because in my head, whenever I hear Gainax, I mentally correct it to Gaina, which is uh, Gainax Fukushima. This is actually Gainax Kyoto, apparently. Oh, okay. All right, I, I am satisfied with that answer. <laughs> I, I think at some point uh, it would be good to have like a real uh, Gainax history episode rather than just sort of folding it into one of these. But one thing that I was thinking about while you were talking was you referred to this as the first duty to be founded by anime fans rather than professional animators. And uh, now that I think about it, I don't actually think that's true. Because although we he wouldn't have called it anime, surely uh, Tezuka was and would be really the first person to found an anime studio as an anime fan i guess what what we what we actually mean by that is saying um non-professional anime fans just what i just want i just want to quibble please continue <laughs> besides the main anime gainax also made a series of shorts where tubified versions of the show's two lead talked about science concepts though their validity is in serious question ian uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think you watched all of them, didn't you? Where is it on the Tachikomido scale of chibi uh, shorts? I mean, it's just there's a blackboard, the two of them are standing in front of it, and they just talk about concepts. Yeah, the only one I would really rate is when, is that when they talked about Lorenz transformations, they actually did put up the correct equations, but the rest of it seemed to be made up. Gunbuster itself was directed by Hideaki Anno of Evangelion fame, it being his directorial debut. Originally, it was supposed to be directed by someone, somebody else, but Anno really liked the script, so he asked to direct it, which was granted, and then he proceeded to change everything about it. Classic Anno. Originally, the anime was also only supposed to have four episodes, which explains the climax at the end of episode four, but then it received two additional episodes, which were now also co-written by Anno, which explains why they feel a bit different. I think partly this was just due to they weren't really sure about the reception of it. And so there was a chance that like either budget was going to get cut, and so it was just like, oh well, we're, this is actually selling. We can we can make some more. It had a direct sequel named Die Buster in two thousand and four, which was made to celebrate the studio's twentieth anniversary. The series' plot and name were inspired by two things primarily: a classic Dazaki Tanis anime named Aim for the Ace, and the film Top Gun. There was also a Gunbuster PS two game released in two thousand and five, which actually looked pretty cool from the bits I've seen on it, but. Of course, it was never translated. And another game that focused on Gunbuster was the third entry in Gynex's strip quiz series, Cybernetic High School Part 3 Gunbuster, in which you could strip the various characters from the show by answering questions correctly. Yeah, they got progressively harder, like, uh, and they were based on particular characters. Jungfrau only had like a few questions in her world, so like, she, but she would ask about the Soviet Union and military technology. Kazumi would ask about and Noriko would ask about cult sci-fi and animation. There has also been talk of a third sequel to Gunbuster being in production, though nothing has been shown of it yet. In 2018, the newly branded Gaina Studio, uh, formerly Gainax Fukushima, announced that one of the projects they were working on did include Gunbuster 3, uh, but they did not give it any uh, release date whatsoever, so we have no idea whether it's actually happening or not. But I think that's everything we have for now, so it's time to... <laughs> but before we actually talk about the episodes, this show features relativistic time travel, which it means that I think if I mention that time skips ahead by seven years for some people and only a week for others, that's a thing. You're just going to need to sort of pay attention to, I guess. So the first episode is probably the most aim for the ace style episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get our introduction to Noriko Takeya, who is a young girl who admires her father, who is an admiral. And after her his tragic death, she enrolls in the uh, Okinawa Girls Space Pilot High School. And she struggles there. She's unable to focus on all the mech controls, especially when a new coach, uh, Koichiro Ota, aka not Tom Cruise, uh, appears and forces them into harder and harder drills. And so she gets very surprised when she is selected as a pilot candidate alongside the school's ace, Kazumi Amano. No one's really happy about this. Uh, not Amano, not the second best pilot, Kashihara, and also not Noriko, because she sees this as validating the rumors that she's coasting on her father's reputation. 
but this sounds like a good time for a train montage. And after a month of intensive training with the coach, she's in a much better place, but she has one final hurdle that she needs to overcome, which is she has to fight Kashihara in a duel, so to speak. She's getting beaten quite soundly, but she decides that she'll turn off the monitors and just sort of feel <laughs> the mech. And this is what it takes to turn it around. And uh, she dispatches Kashiwara with one uh, lightning kick. And from here on, we can move to space. This episode features full frontal female nudity. So in episode two, we get a quick flashback to uh, Admiral Takia's final moments where he gives up his uh, space on a lifeboat of the Luxian for Ota, who was the coach we saw in the previous episode. And this episode is kind of all about the ramifications of that event. Kazumi and Noriko will arrive at the space station where they'll be training until the giant Excellian spaceship is ready to take them to fight the aliens. Because there's aliens. I don't think I'm, I didn't mention this, but there are <laughs> aliens. I mean, why else would you train space pilots? Also, it's 2023 and the Soviet Union still exists for some reason. But uh, since you mentioned this, the, the Soviet Union, uh, we get introduced to the third main character, so to speak, uh, Jung Freud, with the worst name in the entire show. But uh, she's mostly there to be an asshole. She takes an instant dislike to Kazumi and challenges her to a fight during their very first combat training session. It's an evenly matched fight, but as the fight ends, the two of them and Noriko discover the, the corpse of one of the Uchu Kaiju, the alien monsters that they're fighting. So after this fight is over and they get into trouble from Coach Ota, Jung Freud seems to be a little warmer to them. Cue the bath to the bathhouse scene. So afterwards, the ship receives news of a giant object that's approaching Earth at near light speed. And Ota naturally volunteers Noriko and Kazumi to go on the recon mission. And during the mission, they realize that this is object Xion, and Noriko enters it in hopes of finding her father. They, are, she, they have arrived at what appears to be only a few days after the father's death, the ship's time, and so she's hopeful that she could find him. But unfortunately, the bridge section is entirely destroyed. Ota pulls her out of the ship, but their delay in returning means that due to time dilation, they'll arrive at the Excellium six months later than planned. Jungfrau tries to comfort her, but in a way that makes Noriko cry. <laughs> so in episode three, we see the introduction of a love interest for Noriko. As the Excellium is transitioning to the warp, the girl pilots on the ship are all together and telling scary stories. Noriko ends up drawing a short straw and has to do a test of courage through the ship. And during her walk, she is frightened because she sees a ghostly light. But fortunately, this ends up being Smith Torn, an American pilot who seems to be doing the same thing. They complete their tests of courage together, but they're caught by Coach Ota and forced to clean the ship's lasers. Meanwhile, a report comes in of an object heading towards the ship at light speed, and the pilots are ordered to sortie. As Noriko is preparing her mech, she overhears Kazumi talking to the coach about how she is too inexperienced and shouldn't be in the battle. Kazumi dissolves their partnership, and instead Noriko and Smith team up. During this fight against the aliens, Noriko freezes up and loses track of Smith. One of the ships gets crippled, there's a shockwave that hits all the mechs, but in the end, Noriko ends up not doing anything in the fight before everyone is recalled. After the battle, she looks through the ship for Smith, but she can't find him, and eventually realizes that he has died. In the hangar, she finds Coach Ota supervising the building of the Gunbuster mech and breaks down and asks him to train her harder. So in episode four, uh, Noriko is now training all the time uh, to the extent that people think she is dating the coach. Eventually, Jung Freud decides that she needs to challenge her to a new fight. But before this can happen, Noriko breaks down, saying she never wants to go into space again. Kazumi still seems to care for her, but they remain apart, and she's still kind of arguing to Ota that Noriko can't protect others. So as the ship is preparing for its long-distance warp jump back to Earth, it gets attacked by the aliens. The pilots are sent to get ready, but Ota prevents Noriko from taking part, and instead gives her mech to someone else. And this is humiliating, to say the least. The fight is a bloodbath, let's be real. Yeah. The alien ships are just like, ah, suck off your, uh, suck off. Uh, <laughs> uh, the alien ships are just shrugging off the photon torpedoes, and there's just so much drones. It's not even funny. 
And so there's a lot of casualties that go along with it. And so the captain, as any sensible person would do, decides that now is the time to ram the alien ships. But he gets informed that the gunbuster has been launched. And surprise, surprise, Noriko is, pi- is piloting it. It only has 10 minutes of power, though. They seem to like using 10 minutes as a, a timeline. Noriko puts it to good use. She vaporizes all the drones with the buster beam, and this buys time for the pilots to return to the ship. When only the mothership remains, it impales the gunbuster, and this is when Noriko drives the fists of the mech into the ship, uh, electrocuting it and creating a massive explosion. And somehow survives. So, good job, Noriko. You did it. I mean, my guess is honestly that since they originally only planned to have four episodes, maybe she was supposed to die here, but then they go like, oh, shit, we're getting two more episodes, so she survives. It's as likely as anything, I guess, but usually in this sort of situation, you'd, even if you're going to like try and martyr her, you would want to, to, to preserve her just because she's the eye candy for the episode. Uh, so moving on to episode five, uh, now they're all back on Earth, and this is when we finally get to see Noriko and Kazumi graduate from high school. But after the ceremony, they run into one of their classmates, Kimiko, who was Noriko's best friend. And she's now 27 years old. She's a kid. And she wants Noriko to try and get her daughter a place aboard the new ship that is being built, the Eltrian, which is being used to evacuate the Earth if the aliens arrive. Noriko gets event- eventually gets called to see Coach Ota. And as she arrives, Kazumi is leaving in tears, but she can't go after Kazumi because this is when Ota falls to the floor of vomiting blood. He says the, to Noriko that she has to keep the, his condition a secret from Kazumi, but Kazumi already seems to know how bad his disease is. His space radiation sickness. <laughs> which is somehow different from other forms of radiation poisoning, but they didn't go into details. So the Earth Defense Command who are, are convened some sort of meeting to try and find a way of destroying this alien fleet. And Ota barges in with his solution, which is that the gunbuster should escort the husk of the Excellion into the heart of the alien fleet, and then blow it up and create a black hole. The plan is ridiculous, but it's the only one they have, so they go for it. It's an anime plan. Yeah. Like, if this was a role-playing game, and I was in charge, I would put this plan into action, because it's, it's, it's stupid. You skip ahead to the fight. And Kazumi breaks down when she realizes that six months have already passed on the Earth. And this means that Ota is likely dead. But Noriko makes her gamberize by explaining that the entire Earth is depending on them. And then they form the gunbuster by merging their two mechs together and eventually start the explosion that destroys the alien fleet. And the episode ends with Kazumi uh, back on Earth, rushing to see Ota uh, and declaring her love for him. He's still alive. Speaking of him being alive, in episode six, he is now dead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's uh, like 24 years. So I think there was like a 15 year time skip. Yeah. Kazumi got married to him at some point and became the head coach at the academy where they all trained. But now she has decided that she's going to go back into space. Humanity is going on the attack and is planning to trap the aliens and then defeat them with a black hole bomb. So basically the same plan. Except bigger. Yeah. So Kazumi, first of all, has to deliver the bomb to the Eltrium, which is now the flagship, and gets reunited with Yugi and Noriko there, who have both been in space the entire time and are thus still teenagers. (laughs) During the operation, Kazumi and Noriko are piloting the gunbuster and have to keep the bomb safe. But the aliens are kamikazing it and trying to disrupt the bomb's shields. There's massive casualties from the aliens, but the barrier of the bomb gets breached, and then the aliens flee to regroup. Now, this would be a good time to set off the bomb, but now the damage from the alien attack means only 98% of the bomb's generators can activate. This is when Noriko decides to volunteer to use her own machine's degeneracy generator as the thing that will set off the detonation device. So Kazumi because this is this is her committing suicide, as uh, like, no, you can't do that. Um, so she fuses her machine, machine <laughs> to Noriko's uh, with the idea that using one generator, the two of them will be able to make uh, it back home. And the explosion gets triggered, 
but it will take 12,000 years before Noriko and Kazumi return to the Earth. And we end on the lights flashing across the Earth, welcoming them back, just as uh, Jungfreud said they would. I'm very glad that you decided not to say any of the episode title. Like, I'm, I will say the first episode title, and I will only say that one, which is, Shock, Big Sister and I are going to be pilots together? Question mark, exclamation mark. I mean, it definitely works for the Aim for the Ace parody that's going for. Like, you could just imagine that being, being the tennis anime, Shock, Big Sister and I are going to play uh, doubles together. Just replace the word pilots with anything else, and you can make it work in the sports anime. Yeah, I, 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 it's very nostalgic. Uh, mm. it, it's very like eighties, and I, I appreciate it. But at the same time, they also take like thirty seconds to say. Let's start then with our central character Norika Takaya. She wasn't that interesting during the first three episodes. She was fine as the typical plucky, hardworking young heroine, though. Saying that, I did quite enjoy watching her. It felt like she was a real character, especially the further on we went with her getting PTSD, her panic attack in the middle of space in episode three. Though I feel like there was a bit of a jump from I'm sitting here in my in my bedroom in episode three, I don't want to go fight, then I jump to the gunbuster, then the next two episodes. She isn't really the central character anymore. It's much more about Kazumi in episodes four and six, uh, episode five and six. Yeah, and I think this speaks to the change between the like the four episodes and the, the the layer two that we keep talking about. The thing that gets me about Noriko is that we empathize with her. She's like the plucky uh, teenager, and she's just wears her heart on her sleeve and is doing her best, but she's not doing very well. But I kind of get it when everyone is saying that she's getting by on her dad's name. Because even though she does eventually sort of make good, I find it hard to believe that it's coming from like talent or even hard work uh, and more through a series of ridiculous accidents and an overpowered super weapon. Yeah, I think when we were watching it, we mentioned that we all felt that Oda's belief in her seemed very unjustified, besides that the fact that her father saved his life. And even she herself was like, I can't do this, but he's like, I wouldn't gamble with the fate of humanity. I know, I believe in you. And, but with no justification whatsoever. Well, I guess at the end of episode one, she does defeat the kind of rival that's introduced for one episode only. She, she do, well, she does defeat Kashiwara, but then she's had a month of intensive training with the coach at that point. Hmm. And while it's still impressive what she manages to achieve within that month, which I guess does partially justify it, I mean, who's to say how well, say, Kashiwara would have done with a month of intensive one-on-one training with the coach? Mm, that's fair. I think the thing where maybe we're supposed to sort of infer is that because she's a very physically active person, we see that she's actually like, like in like really good shape. She's able to like do all these sorts of athletic things in the first mm. episode. She successfully runs the 50 laps she is sentenced to do as a punishment. The way I read that entire thing was that uh, everybody else kind of relies on the machine, whereas Norika, it's her own physical ability. That would translate well to the Gumbuster in this case. Yeah, this is what this is what I was trying to what I was trying to get. Uh, at the same time, even if I t- even if I be very very generous, she's definitely getting a much better deal than most people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, other than like the PTSD and all the ho- so horrible stuff that's going to happen to her later on, obviously, but just just within that first episode. I mean, that PTSD was actually one of my favorite things characterizing her. I'm not saying I'm glad she has PTSD. I'm just saying it made her much more human. The battle in episode three where she's out with Smith Torren, it's just a great scene all around. She's in the middle of space. It's black. And we don't see the enemies. They just We just hear them over the radio and Torren scre- uh, like asking for help. And she just freezes up completely. You do see them as like red streaks going past. Yeah, yeah, like, they're too overwhelming to really be shown at that point, even though we've seen them before, but here they're just kind of a blur that she's unable to react to properly, even with all the training she's received up to that point. Yeah. And that just made her feel much more human than than if she'd just overcome the panic attack in the middle of it, or if she'd still managed to do something. But no, she's just completely frozen, and there are actual real consequences to it with the death of Smith-Torren, who 
isn't really a character. He's just kind of there for Noriko to make googly eyes out of then to die so she can feel sad about him. And he's American. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> those are his those are the fighting characteristics. He is a prototype Kaoru and is way less successful, obviously. They stole Guile's hairdo. The character was actually of Smith Torrin was actually based on a uh, Canadian translator that was living with Gainax at the time, and they were good friends with him, so they decided to reference him in their show. He also uh, voices one of the side characters. I, w- I mean, it's kind of a nothing to say this, but like she's really defined by the, her ver- relationship with Vera, the expectations that they ha- are placing upon her. Mm. So, like, the coach is the one we've mentioned the most often, which is just like the he is sort of imposing his idea that she's a successful pilot, even though she doesn't believe that. We've said Smith Torrin with this romantic relationship, but we haven't mentioned like her relationship with her dad, which is like her entire motivation for becoming a pilot in the first mm-hmm. place. And never really goes away. <laughs> we learned nothing about her mother. So uh, this seems to be one of those weird cases where, like, I guess maybe she's a daddy's girl. I mean, we, the, the very first shot of the, ep- of the series is her, a picture of her with her dad and her talking about her that. And the, the scene in episode two where she, where she breaks mission protocol to go into the ship desperately trying to find her dad was also a very strong scene. That's a good scene. Though... Speaking of the belief you uh, we mentioned we mentioned a second ago, it's something that just came to my mind. And since I've recently rewatched Gurren Lagan, it kind of reminded me of that because there, Kamina is constantly telling Simon not to believe in himself, but to believe in believes in the me that believes in you. And that's kind of what Coach is doing here, except that for Simon, it very often works. Like believing in Kamina gets him through it. But yes. even though Noriko believes in the Coach and she does all her training, it doesn't ma- mean anything once she's thrown out for to actual combat. And this is where the other relationship with uh, Kazuki Miyamano comes in, mm. which is that like she is the Onesama, she's the eight hotshot pilot, and so part of her her lack of belief stems from comparing herself to Kazumi, who is just the best. <laughs> <laughs> the at least to, to, to Edward's appearance appears to be perfect. You can know exactly which like shoujo archetype she is. Not not as in like the best character, but like she never really feels that she lives up to uh, uh, Amano's shadow. Especially since we have multiple scenes across the first three, four episodes where she happens to overhear Ama- uh, Kazumi talking to the coach or other people and going, yeah, she's not quite good enough and maybe I want to change partner. I don't think I should be partnered up with her. It's irresponsible for you to be putting her in this position. I mean, she's completely right <laughs> for both of their sakes, but it still hurts uh, Noriko a lot. But this, uh, this is an like an interesting counterpart to the coach in the like the two people who are like her clo- the closest people to her like in the military, I guess, are just be like one of like is like you're the greatest, and the other is like you're nothing. <laughs> oh no, 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 she's not that like that. <laughs> no, no, she's not. I mean, Jung Freud is a little bit that. But one of the other things that we see between her and Noriko is that in episode one. She talks to Noriko about hard work. She actually gives her the bandana that Noriko wears most of the time she goes out into combat. And um, we also see her running up the stairs with iron getas on, which are like traditional <laughs> Japanese shoes. That was a pretty funny scene. Uh, the other important relationship uh, in her life is her relationship with the coach, which we primarily explore in episode five and a little bit in episode six. I personally felt that it kind of came out of nowhere. It definitely feels like something that wasn't part of the original like four yes. episodes and just was added because everybody like Jung was interested in the coach and other people were, but Kazumi never really felt like she had an interest in him. Well, I disagree. That it's been there since uh, episode two because it's one of the ways in which Jung Freud is there to antagonize it when she's like talking about how she has the hearts for the coach. Like you can see the look in um, in Kazumi's eyes, and mm. I guess. We don't really know the extent to like her interest in the coach um, until li- much later on, but they, they they planted the seeds at least as at least yeah. in episode two. I guess that's fair. How do we feel about the relationship in general? I mean, other than the ethics of dating your coach, <laughs> <laughs> well, more like the ethics of your coach dating you. I mean, there isn't much there. It's it's a uh, yeah. it's done mostly in the. Uh, Ah, oh, wouldn't it be great if I could marry the coach style? Rather, and it because she never really seems to be able to like tell the coach how she feels. That's kind of the point of episode five. Yes, and uh, the drama of that 
their connection being uh, distorted by the time dilation. There isn't meant for us to see what their relationship could be like away from Noriko because we just follow Noriko pretty much the entire time. And mm -hmm. so every time we see like uh, Amano, they're either like doing stuff together in like m military exercises or she's telling the coach <laughs> that Noriko shouldn't be getting into the fight. So maybe there is like a really detailed thing that's happening off screen, but. I mean, I think the main thing we really see how the relationship influenced her is her becoming a coach in episode six, essentially taking yeah. up his role. But yeah, a lot of the characters are, are quite simple because it is only a six episode OVA. There's really only the three we talked about who get any kind of um, depth beyond that. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know if coach really worked that well. I mean, I appreciated Norio Wakamoto playing Tom Cruise, but that was about it. <laughs> this, is, this is an unpopular opinion. I got really distracted by his, the way he um, says his lines. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Just because I feel like he always delivers uh, a line the exact same way unless he's, unless he's yelling. Uh, <laughs> and that took me out of it a bit. I think the most surprising thing about him was that he was still alive at the end of episode 5 when they came back, rather than being dead. Well, that's something they could have a nice uh, moment. Yeah. I don't know, it, it, it felt a little unearned, but whatever. Like, the mentor figure should have died. I'd have killed the coach, and not just because I would kill every character. <laughs> when would Kazumi's position in uh, episode 6 feel justified? Probably not, because then she would have just gone back with Noriko into space, most likely. Well, I meant from like a character perspective, not an in-universe. I guess we need to see like the kind of it's the this was worth fighting for. This air quotes yeah. love was worth everything we've been through. It's more that he's just Noriko is the main character and Kazumi is the deuteragonist, I guess. So we're not really supposed to know what she sees in him, but it just felt make the relationship feel a bit odd, and that's fine. But then they based a whole episode around it, which. I don't know, how do you feel about episode 5? I like bits of it, though the panic attack that Kazumi had while they were like, in the middle of the enemy fleet kind of felt a bit out of character. Like, I understand the way it works. It's, oh, at this point I've finally come far enough that he'll be dead. But at the same time, you knew exactly what was going to happen and you had more than enough time to prepare yourself for this. And Well, I mean, this is the thing, right, is that she didn't actually, we never actually had that much time to do it. Yeah. It does work from like a perspective of, oh, Noriko's, well, not overcome you, but become your equal by um, talking you down in that scene. Uh, but outside of that, I found episode five a little frustrating, even though it, the animation was a bit, well, even better than the first four episodes. Mm -hmm. I think one of my favorite shots in the series is the end of episode five, when we just have the gunbuster standing on the hills. That robot scale is all over the place. <laughs> He's supposed to be 250 meters at one point, at the other, and the next time he's just as tall as an average hospital, which is definitely not 250 meters. I think the image I saw was he was like three quarters of an Eiffel Tower. <laughs> <laughs> Gunbuster! One of the main important things, I wouldn't really necessarily call it a theme, but it's definitely very important to the plot is the notion of time travel that they've introduced, which is based at least semi-realistically <laughs> on relativistic physics and the idea that um, time dilates uh, relative to a, a, a given observer when you're moving very fast at the speed of light. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it because I definitely want to talk about time travel in general <laughs> uh, in another episode. This was kind of something that I wanted when we talked about Penguin Highway, which was, yeah, you can include all of the bullshit you want uh, for plot devices, but I want just a little bit of real science in there. <laughs> like, how did you, you two find um, the passage of time as it was occurring in the show? Because obviously we have to take into account two different time scales: the time scale of well, I guess the the Earth versus the Excelion, and maybe even the Excelion versus the uh, Gunbuster or the RX units or whatever. Uh, it was probably my favorite thing about the show, to be honest. Especially the way it like ties thematically to like the themes of like loss and uh, losing all your connections. 
this is one way you could read it is like commenting on the relationships with, of soldiers to um, the people back home, I guess. It's like mm. you go off to war, uh, you do all your horrible fighting, and then you come back and everybody's sort of moved on without you. And the kind of um, disorientation that comes from that. Yeah, I, that that's a really interesting read. I hadn't really thought about it, but I can definitely see that. Like in episode two, when they go to the ship, they're gone for six months, but for them it's barely two minutes. So when they return, everybody else is having a party, but Noriko is still really shaken up. The time displacement was definitely one of the most interesting things in the show for me, because I don't think I've seen many other things that to address this impact of space travel. Interstellar did it, I think, and... Mm-hmm some other things, but nothing I can really remember. But here, it felt like it was really used to great effect, especially through Kimiko, uh, Noriko's childhood friend. Having, seeing her, like, grown up and Noriko just graduating 10 years later than everybody else. And essentially, it's kind of a perpetuating cycle. Like, she's completely lost out of time, so what does she do? She doesn't stay on Earth to find her roots again. No, she goes back into space to keep fighting. Because that's that's the only place she can be now. That kind of nowhere, that space without time. It ends with this weird effect where uh, Kazumi is clearly aged in the last episode, which is cool. You don't often get to see middle-aged women going and piloting mm-hmm. mechs, so props for that, I guess. Meanwhile, Noriko looks more or less the same. I think her eyes have hardened a little bit in the last episode. Uh, you might be right. It's hard to remember at this point. <laughs> yes. I mean, it also plays into the kind of coming-of-age story, because usually coming-of-age stories are stories where time has passed and you're no longer a young person, you're now a teenager or an adult. But Noriko doesn't age, that's kind of the point. Whereas everybody else in her life kind of moves on. Well, except Jung Freud, but she doesn't matter. Well, yeah, everyone outside of like the military on the ship that she has done. One thing that I would like to see, and that I'm hoping we that I think we might see in Die Buster, is the sociological implications of a society where people are moving through time at different, well, speeds. We do kind of see that at the very end in episode six, when they return and um, Welcome Back is written by in giant like lat- lights across the earth. The final letter is reversed, kind of implying that in the last 12,000 years, they, can't, they don't really speak the Japanese Noriko and Kazumi spoke anymore, so they got it wrong. Yeah. In the end, that society has moved so far beyond them. I'm not, most, yeah, I'm not so much interested in the 12,000 years in the future thing, but in the, the episode 5 stuff, for instance, with, with Kimiko. Because, well, by the time they get back, I mean, they have to disband uh, the top squadron because the top squadron has been like just decimated. But on Earth, they've had to, pl- they've had to plan for an entire like new kind of ship in case they have to evacuate the mm. Earth. The thing that Noriko probably never appreciated about her father is that although he only came back every year for her birthday like for him he was probably seeing her like every week (laughs) I mean that's a bit of an exaggeration while he'll still like feel the loss while he's away in um in space it definitely isn't going to be the same in the same way that like my dad would have felt when he was working in Egypt for six months at a time and then coming home it's it's kind of it's kind Mm -hmm. of different we also saw this with the graduation ceremony, where they've graduated from high school ten years too late, and they're the only people there. <laughs> I don't even. I doubt that the principal was their principal. <laughs> Who knows what teachers are still there, and so on and so forth. Just think about everything that happened last year, and I imagine that like you, you, you were just you just came back, and like I had someone had to explain to this, and you were like, "Well, I was just away for three days." <laughs> Just questions like, what does a birthday even mean in the when you're traveling through time at different rates? Like, mm. what does it mean that like your birthday is the sixth of June or whatever? I think it's fair to say that we all really enjoyed the time dilation aspect of the story. The next thing I want to talk about is Gumbuster as an homage to other anime. I mean, it's it's a Gainax staple uh, as the founders were first and foremost anime fans. Like Daikon three and four are just and Attack on a Video are full of references to other shows. And Western media, like Darth, I think Darth Vader is in Daikon 4, isn't he? Yeah. And various other things. The entirety of episode one is just, as we've said, an Aim for the Ace parody. Uh, like, I watched episode one of Aim for the Ace just to see how it compares. And it hits all the major beats. We have, in both shows, we have a new coach. We have uh, um, a person introduced as the talented star of the tennis slash mecha club. Um, 
both protagonists mentioned their star sign at one point in the episode. Uh, we have the main, the talented person questioning the coach on why the other one was chosen. We have the other girls in the team distrusting the protagonist and this mentally affecting her. Like it's all very closely uh, built on it. And episode one was one of my personal favorites just because of the whole let's do sports things, but inside giant robots, giant robots doing push ups, sit ups, forming like a cheerleading pyramids, or you have to do fifty laps in a giant robot. And, I, and, I, and there, there definitely are people out there who be like, why would they be doing that? And well, one, it's actually not a stupid idea because like you're testing out your ability to have control over the mech in like a very fine, uh, fine grained manner. But it was just there as a joke, and uh, like that was the point. It was just like, just don't don't think about it. Just just enjoy the robots doing press ups. One of the things I thought to myself is, is this one of like the first reference anime in a way? Most modern, like a lot of modern anime include dozens and dozens of references to other existing shows, but like the further you go back, the less direct references to things there are because the medium was still evolving. So I'm wondering whether we can count like Gainax and Gumbusters, like one of the first big reference heavy shows that aren't just like stylistic influ- uh, influences or because they share the same animator. Possibly, we don't know is the answer. Probably. Um, just based on do your own damn research if you care. I mean, at least some of the references are like important. I mean, the importance of like of uh, Getter Robo to this show cannot be overstated. <laughs> the famous Gainax pose, which comes from Getter Robo, uh, <laughs> came in this show in uh, episode four. Also, the Noriko in episode six ripping her heart out to defeat. The enemy, quotation marks, also a Geta Robo reference is because it's Geta Robo Armageddon. I can't remember which one it is, but Banke rips the, the engine out of his Gitter and it blows up. So what do we think the aliens are supposed to uh, represent in this? Uh, I think at one point in the show they called them the antibodies of the universe. They're there to wipe out humanity. It's an idea that's been done before and afterwards. The idea of humans are the illness that need to be cured from the galaxy. Yes, and uh, Gumbuster's response to that seems to be, uh, well, we'll overcome it with the good old human determination and technology. Specifically Japanese technology. Yes. Because this was made in the 80s in the period of... Um, the idea of uh, Japanese technological quote-unquote superiority, I guess. Um, and that kind of bleeds into some of the more unfortunate aspects to this show. The reason I took the military uh, angle earlier, I think, is because I was kind of viewing the show in that vein going in, which is unfortunate, due to a excellent series of articles on the website Anime Critique outlining how this show is very imperialist but in ways that would not be obvious um, because of the way it's been translated. And this is close to me. I would not have um, known it apart from the really obvious stuff like the enormous Japanese flag in the um, space station. Like I watched the show earlier in 2020 before we watched it again for this podcast, like a few months earlier, and I did not notice a thing really. Yeah. It's, it's really kind of crazy when you read the whole article laid out, like all it's six parter, one for each episode. I mean, at least a, at least a quarter of them were a bit of a stretch, but I, 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 but a lot of them were really good points. There, there's a few things, uh, like the fact that the first episode is set on uh, Okinawa, and there is no native uh, Okinawans there because, of course, there will be. But it's a symbol of ah, we got the da- we got our damn military base back from the Americans. Oh uh, yeah, there, there is a pre-existing timeline for Gunbuster in which. The Americans sell Okinawa to Japan, then later decide that that was a bad idea and attack Okinawa. Or... There was a second bombing of Pearl Harbor involved somehow. <sighs> I think it was the Americans bombed Pearl Harbor this time, though. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. So there's the, the naming scheme of the... Um, most of the Earth defense stuff implies that Japan is in charge of defending the Earth. Meaning, and specifically Imperial Japan, how that happened, who knows? 
makes about as much sense as the Soviet Union still existing <laughs> and still apparently being communist because of the star of the uh, hammer and sickle on the um, on Jung's mech. In fairness, the Soviet Union hadn't fell apart at the time the show was made. Yeah, but like Perestroika had happened. People knew it was going to fall apart. Fucking um, um, Gozenza Sama Bambanzai referenced stuff about how it was falling apart. <laughs> I actually think one of the biggest things to convince me of its imperialism was the article's bits on uh, the bath scene in episode two. Because episode two, we have this massive bath scene where we have Kazumi, Noriko, and Jung Freud in the bath. And Kazumi, like, she's... We don't see anything of her in the nude. She's uh, up to her neck in water, if I remember correctly. For Noriko, we just see the breasts. But for Jung Freud, we get uh, her in the full-on nude. Breasts with nipples, vagina, the works. Yeah, and then we have we have a scene where they're talking about the coach, and Jung Freud is sitting in front of a backdrop of the American Moonlander, and she's a redheaded uh, member of the Soviet Union that wears a castle cross around her neck. Yeah. And the article posits that she's the ultimate representation of the other, uh, and how she essentially gets continually defeated by Kasumi the ultimate representation of the Japanese beauty ideal, the uh, Nadeshko, um, the Yamato Nadeshko, so to speak. And how she's not allowed to take part in the big sacrifice at the end. Mm, only pure Japanese are. <laughs> Which um, is an interesting point. One thing that I think kind of poisons the big themes of uh, this show about like sacrifice and um, doing your best mm. is that the last episode is uh, entirely in black and white, except for at the very end, which was a mm. nice touch. And this was partly done as a reference to, um, well, partly done because one of Anna's favorite films is the uh, Battle for Battle. Okinawa. And a major uh, part of that is um, portraying the um, native Okinawan sacrifice, being forced to um, use kamikaze tactics as a good thing, as it's good that they're laying down their lives for our country like this. Um, which makes the whole themes about sacrifice, I don't know, to me it poisons them a little bit. Uh, now I, I accept that, uh, obviously I have a very different view on this to um, Mr. Anno, though maybe he did some reflection on this. Um, how do you guys feel about it? And the, the fact that this show is bathed in imperialism is very unfortunate, but honestly, to me, the fact that it's so subtle in a way that the average viewer couldn't detect it. I'm not sure whether that makes it better or worse for the for nowadays that the that the Western viewer couldn't uh, would it would just fly straight over their head. The point of the article was that many of the signs were not noticeable because they were on things that were not translated because they were signs and all the stuff that doesn't usually get translated because. So you could take the entire show as just you could just take the whole thing as a cool robot show with some babes to look at and some cool action oh, and that's it. And you, and then you'd be ignoring a whole bunch of the actually good stuff in it, like the time dilation things. Yes, but, uh, yes, but you know what I mean. Nothing, nothing is just a show about robots and, and All girl. you need is a gun, a girl and a gun to make a movie or a show and a giant well, robot. While Jean-Luc Godard no doubt meant that, he was he's also a pretentious asshole who definitely <laughs> made films about things. So <sighs> I, I thought Denny was going to actually say the, the Toshi Okada version, which was all you need is a girl who goes to outer space and a giant robot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the imperialism definitely taints the show, but there is still a lot of good in it. Well, yes, I guess it's a bit of a backhanded compliment that the imperialism is... Um, is so well baked into the show because Anna was a good director. So before we move on, I guess we should probably also mention the, the, some of the fan service elements. This is um, the origin of the infamous Gainax Bounce. It's the origin of that term for the West anyway. Mm. Yeah, which is to say having characters not wear bras so that their breasts jiggle and then animating that ridiculously careful. No, I don't think anybody's really cared about whether they're wearing bras or not. That's like the justification, I guess. I mean, it's not as ridiculous here as it is going to be in some other Gainax shows, like Gurren Lagann and Yoko's breasts are just flying about in every which way whatsoever. Here it's 
it's still fairly realistic, but they do jiggle a lot. Like there's a famous shot in episode one where she's like walking, marching determinedly and it just goes up and down and up and down. And there's another scene in episode five where uh, where she's lounging on her bed and it's kind of just there so we can ogle at her while she's lounging on her bed and her top is kind of coming off. Yes. it's. I mean, it's part of the Gynax kind of... Uh, Style, almost yes. style. It's it's part of Gynex's style, which does not make it any better. No, and it's it's one of those things where, like, we already talked about, like the the scene at the end with the the ripping of the chest, and like, she, she, literally, while she's in the robot, she rips off her own part of her clothing to reveal uh, an exposed breast. Well, actually, I I thought that one worked rather well within the episode as a literal kind of ripping out your own heart. Somehow it didn't feel too sad fans. Obviously, it, it felt like it worked within the scene. It kind of reminded me of those old French paintings about the French Revolution, where we have the topless woman as the leader of the revolution. Sure. There's been a lot of discussion about whether that is good or not. I don't know whether it's good, but I just think it worked within the scene. Like, I didn't find it... Oh, yes. I didn't feel like we were supposed to ogle at that compared to the other scenes where we were definitely supposed to ogle. But I do feel like uh, I do understand like the it taking people out of the scene, mm-hmm. uh, but that's okay. I, it didn't uh, bother me that much. Like I read it, I took it the way you did. But, but in other scenes, it's definitely like a purely a voyeuristic camera. And I also think it's telling the the uniform that they wear throughout the entire show, even into the twenty four days, <laughs> is a gymnastics uniform. Yes, <laughs> for some reason. I mean, it's clearly someone's kink, but... <laughs> yeah, it's a bit frustrating at times. The last thing I kind of want to talk about when we talk about this, I personally felt that the second half of the series was stronger. Uh, Anno himself said in an interview, uh, the move into direction was hard. My personality doesn't lend itself to direction. I was not functioning well on the first two Gunbuster episodes. And uh, I wanted to know if you two agreed with that or not. Like, I, I thought episode five, uh, episode four, five, and six were stronger than the first three. I mean, the later parts of the uh, the show are also where he took more of a hand in the writing of the show. Yeah. yeah, I do think it's kind of funny how he essentially gets three completely distinct climaxes. Because yes, the end of episode four, perfectly reasonable climax. The aliens are defeated. Norica survived. They go home. Oh, the beginning of episode four. No, the aliens aren't dead. They're back with an even bigger fleet. End of episode five. The enemies are defeated. Gunbuster goes home. Kazumi's reunited with the coach. The Gunbuster looks out over the hills of Japan that it's protected. But beginning of episode six. No, the aliens are still alive. So we compress Jupiter into a black hole bomb. And we're going to use that to finish them off for good this time. Is it Jupiter or Jupiter 2? I don't remember. Fucking Jupiter (laughs) 2. I, I, I couldn't, they wouldn't have huh? said Jupiter 2 because you only learn about Jupiter 2 in the science shorts. Yeah, it was just Jupiter. I don't know if I f- fully agree with the second half being better. Okay. Because, like, episodes one to four are all a little self contained thing around um, Noriko's development. That, and I think that through line worked. Episode five, I, I think I've already said that. I will say it was better directed than the ones before it. I think we can agree on that. Episode five and six are generally directed, and they look a lot. And they look a bit better than the first four episodes. Yes, but I found it's like the like character content in it a little like iffy. And episode six is good with qualifications. One of the things that you may not have noticed is that structurally, the first five episodes are all like a two-part uh, structure where we get half the episode uh, devoted to, like, Noriko character development, and then we got a fight. I mean, really, the fight is also character development, but... Uh... <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's it's mostly a fight. <laughs> episode 6 is interesting, because it's mostly from Kasumi's perspective. In fact, it pr- almost entirely is, until the actual, like, battle bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really does feel like we said that Kasumi became the main character in the last two episodes, because it all centers around her rather than yes. Noriko. And... To be fair, Norika's story was kind of complete at the end of episode four. Yeah. She'd saved the world. She'd found her place at the helm of the Gunbuster. Yes. Well, I, I disagree. I don't think her story was complete until she went back into space in episode five. Mm. The fight was unnecessary. Gunbuster! 
So one of the things that we already mentioned was the the final episode was done entirely in black and white. Uh, at great expense, we are told. <laughs> it was totally worth it. <laughs> yes. Did they say how they did it? From what I read, I don't know. My assumption is that I think my, my feeling is that they were colored properly and then filmed in black and white. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know... Anno claimed this last episode was inspired by the Japanese uh, series Ultraman on monochrome television as well. I realized special effects look better in black and white. Arguably. Depends on the type of special effect. Mm -hmm. And it's not just black and white, uh, episode 6. We also have a bit in it where it essentially becomes a slideshow, which is a reference to old wartime newsreels where... Uh, both in the anime and in real life, the new, these newsreels gave updates about the war, such as how many planes or ships and uh, were destroyed. And it kind of gives the conflict a grander scale, even though we don't really see what's happening. Well, also the whole thing being in black and white um, gives it this sort of old-timey military mm-hmm. feel and helps with the like themes of disconnection. It's like It's almost like you're viewing the whole thing as a window into the past. Uh, from 12,000 years in the future. Mm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying this just to be glib, but we always kind of, in 2020, we would associate black and white with, like, a more serious thing. Uh, and so whether whether or not it was, like, specifically intended for that, I think it was definitely that it's a good choice for, for saying, this is serious now. <laughs> Pay attention. Kind of like the beginning of Saving Private Ryan. Mm. There are also, like, no, there's no real, like, jokes in it like there were in the earlier episodes. There's a bit of banter between Jung and uh, Kazumi in episode 6, but otherwise there isn't really anything else. It also really amplifies the um, uh, the like light coming off the punch they do. That looks mm. really... That really works really well in there. It's, uh, it really allows them to sort of like up the contrast. It's really good. Yeah. And then at the end, when they return to Irv and the color kicks back in, it just makes it all the better. Yeah, it's good. As far as Akikaburu is concerned, this was uh, done by Hideaki Anno. Yes. I mean, since we're on the Gunbuster, how do we feel about um, the the mech itself visually? Look, I'm not a I'm not a mech fan. It sure is another giant robot. I like that it has a rib cage. Honestly, I prefer the uh, the uh, the like normal ones. In particular, I like um, Jung's mech's Sputnik. Um, Lenses on its head. That's a nice touch. <laughs> oh, there's also the Adidas mech, which is definitely not sponsored by Adidas. Look, that was like the only brand that was misspelled in like the entire show. But yeah, like I mean, this sounds weird when I'm going to say this, but like it kind of seems like if the ancient Egyptians made a mech, this is what I think it would look like. Hmm. Guess I can see that. <laughs> I'm not sure I necessarily can. I am a mech fan, and I do think I I quite like the design in its simplicity, with its with its black and orange color scheme. The thing that I don't like about it is the fact that it's kind of got like this cyclops part to it that doesn't do it for me. I mean, it works well when they're they're using it as like a laser beam because then it's just it's just a gun. But when I actually see it, it's like no, this isn't doing it for me. <laughs> I don't think I personally have a problem with that. One of the main things that I do really appreciate about it is its scale. As in, yeah. Freya says, it's just another giant robot, but no, this really is a proper giant robot. So when we talk about giant robots, mostly they're about the, sa- uh, about the scale of a building, uh, a house, maybe two. But this is, as Ian said, two-thirds of an Eiffel Tower, a 250-meter proper gigantic robot. And we just yeah. don't get too many of those. It was the scale of the things that really that really I enjoyed as well, because like the Eltraeum or the Excelion are like seventy kilometers long, mm-hmm. yeah. which all which means that they have to be built in orbit because you, otherwise they would just not be able to get out of the Earth's atmosphere. I'll tell you what I did like the alien designs mm. uh, in the first five episodes, anyway. I really like the coral motif, um, and also how colorful they are in contrast to the, like they have they have like kind of I don't know if pastel is the right word, but like technicolor pastel type colors compared to the more like stock matte like blue and grays of the uh, human. It also yeah. gets lost in the last episode though, where they're all the same shape, 
and they're all kind of grey. And it's just because of the scale they were they were going for. They just had to simplify it, I think. I do also like that they look like proper aliens. Like, they're not humanoid in any way, even want to communicate. Because way too many shows just make the other, make the aliens humanoid or somewhat still recognizable in, in a way. I was thinking, like, when I saw them, that I was getting kind of, like, almost Naushka vibes. You know, mm-hmm. like, the, the bugs in Naushka. Which I guess makes sense given the bunch of people uh, like Hideaki Anno had, had worked on uh, Naushka. And mm-hmm. it's probably an intentional reference to like the man versus nature stuff in that film, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of animation, uh, a lot of, well, I'll let Ian talk about this, but there was a lot of really good effects. I think if there's two things that you would generally like associate with Gainax, it's like a lot of care for towards machines, which I'll talk about in a second, and the effects animation. So, like a fantastic example is any time an explosion happens in space. <laughs> uh, if there's like a Shoichi Masuo cut, I think this was the one you were saying, like when the Gunbuster is electrocuting the uh, alien like mothership thing, mm-hmm. and it's just so much color. <laughs> It's Porygon seizure levels of uh, flickering, but then it explodes and you just see all these sorts of like colors. I can only imagine that they, that someone was had to go on a cell and flick paint it to Jackson Pollock style to do it because I can't imagine it being done any other way. Like I've got a screenshot right now and if I were to count like all the little dots, I'd be here all day. There's like thousands of them. Going back to size for, for a second, while it did really enhance my enjoyment of it, it was also one of the show's biggest weaknesses in the way that it was just completely inconsistent with its size. As we already mentioned, the, both the Gumbuster and the Excellion at times feel humongous, and at other times they feel like they're just a normal sized chip or just a normal sized giant robot. And yeah, a normal sized giant robot like all the other giant robots. <laughs> But the show wasn't great uh, in terms of uh, keeping its scale correct at all times. Do we think the character animation was particularly good? I thought it was kind of, while it was very like fluid, I don't know if it got, always got across like the, the characters that well. I mean, it definitely feels like the most effort was put into the jiggle physics uh, in terms of character animation, but otherwise I think it worked fine. Mm. There are a few moments where I think it worked quite well, like when we get to episode 6, the scene when Noriko rips her heart out is just great in terms of character animation but other Mm. than that it's mostly just solid work nothing really outstanding compared to a lot of the other things in the show i do like um that most of the main characters have differently shaped eyes that's usually related to their character in some way noriko has kidney shaped eyes (laughs) whereas uh, kazumi has the like stereotypical um yamato nadeshko type eyes coaches are hidden most of the time and, like, the bully in the first episode has the, like, narrow evil eyes and stuff like that. I do think, color-wise, it is pretty on point most of the time. As I already said, the aliens look really good. But it is also just a very colorful show all around. Like, the Excellion is bright blue. The Gunbuster is probably the most subdued thing in the show. Mm. Yeah, uh, some of the color use is uh, good for, like, the lighting inside the mechs. Um... Because uh, in the second episode, uh, for some reason, like Kasumi's the inside, her cockpit is blue, Young's is purple, and Noriko's is orange. Um, I'm sure if we thought about that more, we could come up with um, like character reasons why that is. Um, but then in in episode three, when um, when um, Noriko is freaking out, uh, like her uh, her cockpit goes red, and that's that's really good. So I did always think it's funny when everybody else could just call everybody else on the mech and just their face pops up on the view screen, blocking vital, possibly vital information. Like I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't tremendously interested in the character animation in this. I liked the skipping scene by uh, uh, Sadamoto in the first that episode, was good. but I didn't really have too much to say about it. So, the final uh, scene that I really want to shout out is uh, one in episode three when the laser batteries are opening on the side of the ship. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this is this, this one's due to the Koji Ito, and it's just, like, clearly someone had to get, well, I mean, Koji Ito <laughs> had to just sit there, like, looking at a lens, <laughs> like a camera lens, and then just drawing, like, hundreds of lines to get it just so perfect. Yeah. 
like all the laser scenes are just like really good. I I I genuinely buy that this is glass, in which is not true of a lot of glass in anime from this period, and like just everything about it. I've been I've been I've just I don't often spend a lot of time just like looking at cuts on the burrow, but I think I've stared at this one like fifty times over the past few days. <laughs> So I think the last thing we then have to talk about is the music. Which, man, did they get a lot of mileage out of Mars Bringer of War. So uh, before we um, make fun of him, I guess, the composer for this is Kohei Tanaka, who we had on something else that I don't remember. But he's done music for One Piece, most famously. Uh, and then in terms of things I like, he did music for Hyoka, and honestly, musically, his best stuff, I think, to me, is from Gravity Rush. Uh, but yes, this is one of the many things where uh, Holst should maybe be owed royalties if copyright weren't a really, really stupid method of doing things. It should be in the public domain by now, right? <laughs> Question mark. Yes, probably. But yeah. Not only did they use the standard um, like percussive um, bit like line on the um, when, uh, beating the strings, they also used the like two note um, thing that's on the um, da da that that um, mm-hmm. motif. Yeah, I mean it is a very good, pe- a very evocative piece of music. So of course everybody quotes it. Mm. Like I, I almost feel bad for the pieces of the planets that are not Jupiter and Mars. Saturn's really good. Saturn's really good. I love Saturn. Like, like, like when does it, when do you ever hear anybody talking about Neptune? <laughs> <laughs> Neptune's also good, and that also gets uh, that also had a lot of influence on Star Wars. Anyway, we're not talking about uh, fucking John Williams. How do we feel about the music outside of making fun of the fact that Mars is used in everything? I'm mostly fine with it. I quite like the Gunbuster merch itself. It's a nice little piece. But other than that, it wasn't one of the standout things for, ab- about the series to me. Hmm. It sure was there. Yep. Apparently the Soviet answer made it in, in a little bit, but I yes. never noticed that. Yeah, I heard I heard this, and the idea was that it was part of a leap motif for Jung Freud. But again, I didn't pay much attention. I didn't, I didn't notice it, so... Yeah. If someone else was listening to it heard it, good for you, you're better than us. I actually went back to the episode with the Soviet anthem next to it, and I was played them a few times to see if I could hear it, and I kind of could, but not really. Honestly, it kind of sounds like it is in the, like, is the Gunbuster match the one that sounds like a Rocky mo- uh, montage song? Yeah, yeah. It it does sound, there's a bit in that that does kind of sound like the Soviet anthem. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. Anyway, uh, the music was fine. The sound mm-hmm. effects, the like sound direction outside of that, also okay. Anno clearly got much uh, more inventive with that later on in his career. What about the opening? Uh, yeah, so both the opening and the ending are done by Noriko Sakai. And the opening is kind of the more interesting one, because I kind of think it sounds like the intro, intro to like a current affairs program from like 1985, <laughs> or maybe something you would see in a promo for a gym. It was fun. <laughs> it was a little fun. There was like a, a, there was a nice like fun synth in there. I did like the way that they that the opening was structured, where they're zooming out from Japan to space to the galaxy, and then moves into the training montage, and then end on a space battle. It was mostly made up of clips from the actual show, though. It was, and what it wasn't was animated by uh, Masayuki, who doesn't seem to have too much for him. But he did work on the Thundercats opening. <laughs> the ending, on the other hand, was just kind of fine to me. I barely remember the ending. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the ending was there. Which is a shame. Gumbasta! So we've talked a lot about the show. Now mm-hmm. it's time to rate it out of five lightning kicks. Did we even mention the Inazuma kick? I don't think no. we did. No, but we've done that a bunch. We've we've done a bun- that a bunch of times already. So let's not explain it. Okay, you don't get to know it. Freya, how many Inazuma kicks are you giving the show? How do I feel about Gunbuster? I think this is one of those shows that I respect more than I like. 
I do like the like structure around development in the first four episodes and then the last two extra climaxes and more about like relationships, I guess. Well, it does get its themes across well, and I think, but I've already said that for me, the imperialism poisons it a bit. And for the side characters, like supposedly not being important, they do show up a lot and there isn't very much to them and they don't really work that well. But visually, there's not, I don't really have much to complain about. I also don't think it's as transcendently, as transcendent visually as a lot of people seem to. Three and a half lightning kicks with a lot of um, asterisks about uh, imperialism. Yeah, I think I mostly agree. It's somewhere in the three to three and a half lightning kick range. I'm not sure how to do half of a lightning kick, but. <laughs> yeah. <You're... laughs> you hit them with the D. Like I like it. I like it better because of the final episode. The final yes. episode really, really. I get. I guess that could be the additional half mark is just for the final episode. And I had a lot of fun with, uh, particularly as I already mentioned, the uh, the effects animation and the mechanical animation, which was which was nice. I wasn't expecting to be as into that as I was. Yeah, it's three and a half. As for me, I think I'm gonna give this show a four. I just enjoyed it a lot on basically every level. I enjoyed the animation, I enjoyed uh, the visuals, I enjoyed the giant robots, I enjoyed a lot of the bits about the story. There's the giant asterisk that takes the point away, which is the imperialism. It's kind of underused characters. It's less than interesting score uh, at times. But even so, I just loved watching this show. It evokes a sense of nostalgia in me, even if I didn't necessarily grow up with watching a lot of old anime. But at the same time, it's just so much fun to watch. So I think I'm going to give it a four. And on the fun note, like people were saying the the paraphrase uh, Jonathan Clements was like, uh, the Wings of Onyamis was uh, Gainax trying to be like auteurs. And this was them just trying to make something that would sell. <laughs> <laughs> and it did. And it, it did. Even though Anna was definitely trying to be an auteur, uh, auteur uh, in the last couple of episodes, because that's what he always does. He can't help himself. Yeah. That's just Anna. Let's not valorize alter theory. Lots of other people put their hearts into this. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, yes, definitely. What, what, do you have any additional facts for us, Danny? Uh, I think I have one, which is that most of the characters in Gunbuster were named after real people. I think I already said with um, Smith Torren, who was a real person, but the lead character uh, was also named after her voice actress, Noriko Takaya. And I think a bunch of the other characters as well. Definitely not Jung Freud, but a bunch of the others. <laughs> yeah, yes. Kazuki, Kazuki Amano was uh, after Okada's wife. I think it was her maiden name. Mm. And uh, the captain of the ship, who we never talked about, Captain Tashiro, was named after their sound director. Hmm. So Anno really likes naming things after things he's uh, naming people after things he's interested in, including psychoanalysis. <laughs> And unfortunately for a lot of the Evangelion char- uh, characters, Japanese battleships. So I think that's, a, that's us on Gunbuster, but we'll be back soon with more Gynax. We've got Diebuster planned in the near future, either next week or the week after that. Uh, and, and after that, at some point, we'll do the Wings of Hanamize. We are the Anime Research Group, a weekly podcast coming out every Thursday, more or less. If you'd like to tell us what you thought of the episode or suggest something for future episodes, you can follow us on Twitter at research underscore anime or drop us an email at researchanime at gmail.com. Goodbye. Buster Beam! Gumbastar.